So welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to another web Medical Mondays with Dr. O. I am Toyi Okwesomi, a family practitioner, HIV specialist, and I treat addictions in Maryland. Um, tonight, we have one of our very own uh, who is part of us and has been on the forum before, Dr. Kende Elisha, uh, who is the founder and CEO of NP Certification Academy, uh, also special ed education, Kende Elisha's Learning Institute, um, speaking tonight. She's going to be talking to us on mental health. We, as you all know, if you had you know notice of this, you will know that we were going to talk on culture, but I'll let her explain why a change of topic and we'll bring her back to talk to us about those cultural differences and how they impact us. So Dr. Elisha, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much for having me tonight. And I really, really appreciate you understanding. Sorry for keeping you waiting. And it's so I'm so excited to be here. And it's my pleasure to be here, too. Thanks for having me. So we're going to be uh, changing topic tonight, but I will definitely talk on something even about very, very interesting. So we can, you know, realize so we can all understand what the award uh, is, is like. And that is schizophrenia. OK, I will be presenting tonight schizophrenia from my slide. Uh, I will do my best to make it as simple as possible. Uh, no jargon, um, you know, it's gonna be straight to the point. Uh, I will make sure, you will see me skipping some slides, but please totally just ignore it. Uh, I will be sharing my slide right now. So uh, give me a second. So before I get started here, I will first of all ask uh, a general question. Does anybody know what schizophrenia really is? Have you ever dealt with anybody with schizophrenia? Have you ever seen anybody with schizophrenia? Okay, now, if you're from Africa, schizophrenia is weary. Weary means madness in the, you know, people that we see on the street. So most of us have seen schizophrenic patients before, we don't even realize it. When we see them, what comes through our mind? Do you want to take off and start running or do you want to walk to them, towards them and see why they gather that way? Or do you want to see if you can help them? Or do you want to see what is going through their mind? Do you even know how they got that way? Do you know what actually what exactly happened? Or do you immediately judge them and think, oh, you know what? They all use drugs. It's because they use drugs. It's because they use marijuana. It's because they use whatever thing, whatever is, it, is the Indian ham or whatever they smoke all over the street. Uh, it is not always true for everybody. Okay, I will break down today schizophrenia, the cause of it, uh, how people get it, the biological basis of it. And I really, really hope you will all learn something today and have a very different perspective about the concept schizophrenia. Okay, I will be switching my slides. I have some images to even show uh, on my slide, but for right now, I wanna teach from here, the content first. As soon as we understand the content, I will now switch to some images to break down even better the types of schizophrenia. But right now, I'm just gonna talk about schizophrenia in general. Speaking here again is Dr. Kenide Elisha, and thanks so much for listening to me. I am a mental health provider, and guess what? I am so passionate about the topic. I, I, and without bragging at all, I am the type that will walk to the street, to, the, to people on the street, and find out how they got there without even thinking whether they have something to hurt me or not. I am that person that will interview my clients when I see they look so bad, and I wonder how they got that way. I wonder if they have a family member and they all tell the same stories. Nobody will take me into their home around their children. But we have forgotten that they are human beings too. And, and, and they didn't create themselves. And sadly, they got this way sometimes because of what they cannot help. And sometimes because of what they did to themselves. But then whatever they did to themselves too is a psychopathology. It's something they cannot help. Okay. So what is schizophrenia? Okay, so schizophrenia, it is the inability to test reality. What do we see when somebody has schizophrenia? We're gonna see hallucinations, we see delusions, disorganized thinking and speech, referential thinking, abnormal moral behavior, negative symptoms. Now, this may sound a little bit technical for you if you're not in healthcare, so let's break it down. So when we talk about hallucination, 
It is what we call positive symptoms. So listen, we have positive and negative symptoms. To, these are criteria that we use in, category, in, in diagnosing people with schizophrenia. When we say hallucinations and delusions, well, you're hallucinating when you are seeing things that aren't there. When you are misinterpreting things that are in your environment, that is called delusion. Disorganized thinking and speech referential thinking, abnormal model behavior and negative symptoms. So what are negative symptoms? Negative symptoms are things that, you know, we see every day. You just see somebody so sad and you don't know. It is the flat affect, anhedonia, elogia. Those are the negative symptoms. And what exactly is the cause of this? It is a neurobiological disorder. Okay, let's forget about people doing Indian M. Let's forget about people doing drugs on the street. Let's forget about people doing cocaine and that's why they got psychotic, okay? Let's now talk about the neurobiological basis of it. It's about the dopamine pathways, okay? Uh, it's, there's an hypothesis that we have too much dopamine in the mesolimbic pathway and too little dopamine in the mesocortical pathway of the brain. And that is why we have people who have psychosis, which, we, which is, you know, in your language, if I have to, if you're not a medical, uh, if you're not a medical pr practitioner and you're here tonight, I would say madness, you know, somebody that is crazy. That's what we, they will call psychosis. Sadly, they use that word to describe them sometimes. I'm not saying it's ideal. I'm just trying to break it down. So now, Somebody now came up with a treatment and said, you know what, when we, if we have too much dopamine in the mesocortical pathway, why don't we come up with an antipsychotic to block the excess dopamine in the mesocortical pathway? Therefore, we can fix the hallucinations so they don't get up and run to the streets and go out naked and start talking to themselves. We can fix that part, but guess what? We also give them something else. Unfortunately, those drugs also have side effect, which we call extra pyramidal side effect. And besides, the mesocortical, the mesocortical pathway has got very, very little dopamine to start with. When we now give them antipsychotic, guess what we do? We now push it down further to lowest level of dopamine, and they're gonna they're gonna continue to get sad. They're gonna get flat. You will never see a schizophrenic patient smiling or laughing at you. All right, there are some concepts in psychosis that we must understand. There is something called hypnopompic and hypnogogic. Now, hypnopompic hallucination is a false perception that occurs when one is in fact waking up. Now, you feel pumped up when you wake up. Now, hypnogogic hallucination is a false perception that occurs when one is in fact falling asleep. Well, that's easy to learn, right? When we remember pumped up when I wake up, I know that the other one is just hypnogogic. And that is when you're falling asleep. Now, what symptoms do we see and what do they really mean in psychosis? We can see hallucinations, which is a false sensory experience without stimuli, visual, tactile, olfactory, gustatory. What about delusions? A false belief firmly maintained despite evidence to the contrary. A delusion can be percussory. It could be delusion. It could be grandiose. It could be somatic. In fact, it could be jealous. You know, you may have a friend or a spouse that say, you're cheating on me. Meanwhile, honestly, they can potentially be delusional. Reality here, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. They might be delusional. It might be true, but they might really be delusional. Erotomanic or something like, oh, I'm God. Religiosity is also part of delusions. Now, what about disorganized thinking? Problems with information organization and interpretation that is best assessed in the speech pattern of the client. Lose association, derailment, they speak in tangent. They, you ask them a question, they go around and around and they just never make a point. What about disorganized behavior? I have seen in, in Nigeria growing up, I see people walk naked on the street. I never understood it. That is why. They engage in inappropriate sexual activity. They walk naked. Difficulties with activities of daily living. Silliness. What about referential thinking and delusions of control? They believe that events, actions, or situations in the environment hold special significance. Thought insertion, thought withdrawal, thought control, and thought broadcasting. What about illusional? Misperce misperception of what actual environmental stimuli. We have auditory, we have visual, tactile, olfactory, and gustatory, which is taste. This can be illusions. Illusion, delusion, very, very common, even in regular people that we work with. You might be working with someone that is delusional right now. You might be, you might be, you might be living with them right now. You, might not, you won't even know it. A person that is delusional is just a normal person. They are, 
they just misinterpreting what is real from what is not real. So a lot of times people with schizophrenia, they have problems in these areas. Their cognition, their perception is all off. Their emotion is totally bland and off. Their behavior is insane. Eye movement, socialization, totally off. Now we think of, you know, we think it's genetics. We think it's uh, chemical. We think it's the brain shape that we, whatever we see on the scan is we saw an enlarged ventricle, right? Or they see an enlarged ventricle, a uh, smaller frontal and temporal lobes, which we're not going to get into. It's cortical atrophy, decreased cerebral blood flow. This is all, this all adds up. And then I explained this earlier. So where am I going to go with this? I'm going to stop right here and turn it into conversation and teach from my head. So I don't turn this into a lecture. So, and I will talk about types of schizophrenia after I make a little comment here. Now, somebody with schizophrenia, okay, in Nigeria, for example, where I came from, if they pass in front of your house, you find a way to chase them. You run away from them. Should we? Or get them help? Should we? Okay, you're working, at, you're working on the streets, even here in, in the United States. Somebody is, somebody's walking around naked. You take your eyes off and walk right past them. Should we? No, should we? So people need help, okay? And based on different cultures, we also perceive it differently. In America, there's a lot of resources out there to at least get them some support. I once told somebody that I was gonna go open a mental health facility in Africa. I happened to tell a pastor actually. He said, the blood of Jesus, I would not try that if I were you because it might be somebody from their great, great grand family that is casted a person with some kind of, or inflicted the person with some kind of madness and now they will throw it on top of yourself. Ma'am, are you kidding me? You know, our perceptions gotta change. Perception about life, perception about things that happen around us and using science to its maximum. I'm not saying negating the old ways, but yeah, negating like 90% of the old ways may make our life better. The way we think, the way we act. Some people suffer due to mental health issues, even with, the, with our elderly, with schizophrenia, gets up in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, we have done syndrome, right? I mean, not done syndrome, we have sundowning, I meant to say. They walk out at night, unfortunately, talking to themselves too. Now, that is a witch that will be stoned to death. Now, we need to get more orientation about things like this because Alzheimer's is real. We have types of dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, Crutzfeld jacob disease. So these are all types of dementias, and it's real. And you are not in tune with reality when you have them. So not every elderly woman out there is a witch. And to those that were stoned to death, it's so sad. And I hope it doesn't, I hope it doesn't exist anymore. If it does, maybe we can start educating people because mental health is real. Okay, so I wanted to put a little piece of culture in there because I didn't get a chance to get into my culture today. But now I'm gonna talk about one more thing before I start giving room to, to questions. And I will also come up with some age range, how, when, when this thing can really occur. And, and, and how we can pay attention to people around us before things get worse. And can we fix the schizophrenia? Unfortunately, we cannot fix it. I'll be straight up honest. Even in the United States, they get medication to wake up. When they wake up, they get, I mean, they get medications to sleep. When they wake up, they get more medication to sleep. And then they wake up again and then they get more medication to sleep. And that is their life. We cannot fix schizophrenia. So what exactly are the types of schizophrenia? I'll be showing that on my slide next. Well, as soon as I'm done with that, I'll be taking some questions because I can see that everybody's looking excited. I can't wait to hear your question either. So we have six main types of schizophrenia. And before I talk about the types of schizophrenia, at what age are we really immune? Are we even immune or not? Uh, maybe not, but to some extent, yes. Okay, so... When I say immune, I mean, at what age can we not get it? So schizophrenia for men is between 18 years old 
to 25 years old. And I know you're thinking, oh, God, Lee, I have a 17 years old. Can you still get it? It's possible. I have a 26 years old. Is that, is that kid free? Probably not. So it can still happen, but that is the most common age that it happens. So what about women? It is between age 25 to 35. And yes, I am 40. Or 40 plus, am I immune? For now, yes. But can anything still cause it? Absolutely. So therefore, the cause of schizophrenia is multifactorial. Okay? So I am now going to go ahead and dive right into types of schizophrenia. We have, I mean, types of psychosis. We have schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, schizoaffective disorder, depressive type, delusional disorder, and brief psychotic disorder. So look, well, what is the difference between all this? First of all, we have a criteria according to the DSM-5, okay? DSM-5 now have DSM-5-TR, which is text revision. So the DSM-5 is our Bible, technically, in mental health. That is where we pull out this diagnosis to diagnose our patients. So schizophrenia, how is it different from schizophrenia form? How is schizophrenia form different from schizoaffective disorder? How is schizoaffective disorder different from, you know, delusional disorder and brief psychotic disorder? So let's break it down. So schizophrenia, everything, by the way, they have the same thing in them, which is what? Delusions and hallucinations and loose association. They all have this criteria. However, the time is what matters. And I will take you to my quick chart that I created uh, during one of my presentation. It's right here. Schizophrenia is more than six months. Schizophrenia form is between one to six months. Sk brief psychotic disorder is less than one month. Schizoaffective disorder, depressive type is what? Schizo that is more than two weeks and boom, depression shows up. Schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, psychosis goes on for two weeks and then boom, bipolar shows up. Delusional disorder, there is no bizarre behavior. So you can actually work with these people. You can marry these people. You can dine with these people. Really, yeah, but they are psychotic. But they are normal people. So if you, God forbid, if you have to pick between brief psychotic disorder and delusional disorder, my students generally fall trap. They will tell me they will pick brief. I'm like, no way, you're picking the wrong stuff because it's brief, it sounds sweet. No, it doesn't. If you get stuck in it, you can be schizophrenic in the next six months. So listen, delusional disorder though, it is still okay. Does it make sense? All we are doing is we are misinterpreting stuff. We are, we are saying this person is cheating on me. That person is lying. That person is this. You're just misinterpreting what you're seeing. Or you're watching the news and somebody is taking over churches and say, oh, they are taking over my church. That is somebody that is delusional. So schizophrenia, you must have at least one positive symptom. Don't forget, initially explained, a positive symptom is what? Hallucinations, delusions, or disorganized thinking or speech. And that must go on for at least six months, minimum of six months. Now, so sorry, I need to stop saying listen. Sorry about that. Now, what about schizophrenia form disorder? Now we have schizophrenia form disorder. Uh, how do we separate that from schizophrenia? Let me take you to my beautiful picture here. Schizophrenia form disorder. Schizo is psychosis and form. So schizophrenia form. This person is not schizophrenia yet. Don't mix it up. So if somebody says, oh, I have schizophrenia form, that is still, they're still okay. It's still within six months. Now, when somebody gets to be full-blown schizophrenia, they're kind of done. Now, schizophrenia form can stay there within one to six months. When I say done, I just mean, you know, they are, it's totally full-blown, right? Now, what about schizoaffective disorder? Schizo is psychosis. Affect, there are two types of affect. We have what? Bipolar and depressed. Two types of affect. So now we're going to separate the word. Schizo, psychosis, affect is mood. So now... When somebody is schizo, as schizo affective, that means they got, they're gonna get psychotic for like two weeks or more. When they are done getting psychotic, a certain affect will now show up and it could be bipolar or depression. In this case, bipolar. That person, whoever is taking care of this person is gonna get their hands really full, period. You're, you just finished dealing with psychosis. Now you're handing a what? A bipolar patient? That is called schizo affective disorder, bipolar type. 
Now, what about schizoaffective disorder, depressive type? Schizo happened for like two weeks or more. Boom, affect showed up right at the end. So, and that affect happened to be what? Depression. That will now be schizoaffective disorder, depressive type. Now, delusional disorder and brief psychotic disorder. Uh, I just like to show you here quickly um, the list of my delusional disorder. Erotonoma, erotomanic, uh, grandiose, jealous. The grandiose and the jealous type is, and percussory type is definitely common in Africa for sure. The percussory type, yeah, that one is common in Africa for sure. Africa, Jamaica, India, yeah, percussory type. Somebody's chasing me, my grandpa, my grandma, you know, my mother-in-law, come on, they are probably somewhere at peace, not even thinking about you. It could be delusion. It could be real too, but mostly it's delusion. I'm sorry. Now, what about grandiose? I am God. I saw God yesterday. It might not be real. What about erotic? <laughs> Excuse me. What about jealous? You're cheating on me. You're cheating. It's all just not real. But they don't get to schizophrenic level is the beautiful thing. I promise you right now, you can be walking with this person right now. And you won't even know it. All right? So that is it for schizophrenia. So what do you think about the presentation? Is your, I mean, are you going to change your mindset? I'm not going to, I'm not saying go walk on the street and we start talking to the homeless and all that. But I think I would like our perception to change. What we see schizophrenics is a very sad disorder. In fact, it is the most researched mental health disorder. We just can't figure it out. How does somebody wake up from their bed in the morning and eat the street naked? I know we do have prodroma phase. It starts slow. You will see people mumbling to themselves. That's the beginning of it. That's the beginning of the madness. It's really sad. All those small, small, they want to isolate. You know, um, you, you get close to them. They look at you like you, they are misinterpreting what they are seeing. You start seeing all those small, small signs. And those are things that should be concerning and must be reported. I mean, God forbid that you see it on, in any of your loved ones. But just in case you run into somebody that need help, that is the way you're going to recognize it. After all, we are here to educate and learn so we can all have different perception about this. Not everybody on the street is a drug addict. Most schizophrenics are homeless and they smoke cigarettes. That is their most worst addiction. And when they smoke cigarettes, unfortunately, it decreases. It, that cigarette smoking is called something we call an inducer. It decreases the effect of the drug that they normally use to calm the schizophrenia down. So unfortunately, they all get on the street no matter what they do, unless they are in a closed facility. That ends it for me today. Thank you so much for listening. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. And that is impromptu. Thank you, Dr. Izugu, for suggesting that she still goes on and presents. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So if you put the slide down, then you make it, if you can, thank you. That's fantastic. So I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, and if anyone has a question, please, you can raise your hand. It makes my life easier. Or you can put your question in the chat box and I'll be glad to uh, read it out. Oh, I was going to ask a question, but my sister, all the way from California, Sister Wumi Kamsin has one. So please unmute and ask your question. Good evening, everybody. And thank you very much, Dr. I can't pronounce it. Elisha. Elisha. Uh, Dr. Elisha for the presentation. It was short. It was very short, but very effective. Oops, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, <laughs> I have a very, very good and uh, good information. I, I, I learned a lot in the probably how many minutes that you did that presentation. I do have a family member that has been diagnosed with residual schizophrenia. What is that? Hopefully I'm pronouncing the word correctly. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that in terms of what type of schizophrenia is that and how is it different from other types? Okay, so... The residual schizophrenia is actually a good news. So good news in the sense that, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's perfect, but at least, you know, it's good news in the sense that this person actually had an episode of schizophrenia and they saw it, but they no longer have delusions or hallucinations or disorganized behavior. So they are kind of 
pretty much in remission, like they are, they are calm. Does it make sense? So the sign of that residual is they will be, they will be having like distorted thoughts. They will be having some odd beliefs, unusual perceptions, but they no longer have it. And sometimes they have this, they have social withdrawal or they cannot even feel pleasure, which is anhedonia. And they don't talk, or they, which is called diminished speech means elogia. Flat yeah. affect, they look sad all the time. Those are called residual. So they are not full blown. So they are still, you can still relate to them. Yeah, okay. But the social part that you just mentioned is very accurate in terms of they're withdrawn. They don't socialize. Right. A sociality is one of the symptoms of residual schizophrenia. A sociality socially withdrawn. And sadly, there is nothing to really do about that. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks You're a lot. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Auntie Tower, you can ask your question. Ma. Welcome. Ma. Hey, Thanks. good evening, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. My question, the first one is you were talking about she's so effective disorder, depressive type. Yes, ma'am. What is that? What is the difference between that one and when people just have regular depression? Oh, completely different. Completely. I would take regular depression 10 times over schizoaffective because schizoaffective disorder, they got to a schizophrenic level, they got to psychosis. Okay, if I have depression, I didn't lose my mind. I didn't disconnect from reality. Anything that has schizo in it, they are disconnected from reality. Does it make sense? They are seeing things that nobody sees. They are, they're actually like almost on the street, naked. A depressed person would not do that. So a depressed person is just lacking some chemical. They, are, they lack two main chemicals, serotonin and norepinephrine. They have that imbalance in chemical, and we can fix that with our regular SSRIs, antidepressants. It doesn't get fixed, but it can at least, we can replenish that chemical imbalance, and it can be functional. But somebody with schizoaffective disorder can potentially actually graduate to a full-blown schizophrenia. But whenever you see schizo attached to anything, it is bad. My other question is, um, you said when they are on medications and if they are smoking, uh, it decreases the effect of the medication. But in most of these uh, psych um, hospitals, um, they allow them to go smoke. Correct. Why? <laughs> so this is what we're going to do we, because we can't force them. We have to respect patient's autonomy. It's part of our ethical principles. There are common ethical principles in medical care. We have justice, beneficence, autonomy, fidelity, veracity. So now they, they have all the autonomy. They are adult. They can go smoke if they want. Now, it is now left for us as providers to use our judgment and titrate the drug as necessary. If I, know my, if I know patient A smokes, instead of giving two milligram of something, I will give four milligram of that drug. That's what we're gonna have to do, correct. If I know they're gonna get a CYP1A2 inducer on top of clozapine, for example, and it's gonna induce it, and it's gonna now send them to full-blown psychosis, mm -hmm. I, will, I will plan better, I will plan ahead and increase that dose. That is ideal to do. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So welcome. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, when we're talking about schizos, you know, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and stuff like that, and then, you know, some schizos now have the bipolar or the depressive right. part, you know, attached to them. Yes. It's freaky, scary. It is. Because um, I'm looking at a schizophrenic person and then the symptoms of bipolar disorder when somebody is manic, you know, they, they have this speech that, you know, they just go on, they, um, they may not sleep for a week and stuff like that. How does it merge in schizophrenia when somebody has mania, for instance, and... Um, the schizophrenic at the same time. Okay, so that's why one ends and the other one picks up. That's the way it works. So for example, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, 
the schizo, they're going to get psychotic for like two weeks or more. It ends and another affect picks up. And they can go in that cycle and go in that cycle and that cycle and that cycle. Bipolar may end again, boom, they are back to psychosis. It's like a cycle. So if they do get manic, so we're gonna be treating the mania and the psychosis at the same time because we're not gonna stop giving that psychotic meds. So the circle just never ends. Mm. So we, are, we treat both together. We treat, we, we target, the, we use a chemical antipsychotic to target our psychosis. And then we use our mood stabilizer to stabilize the mood. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I'll reserve my other questions for later if I have the time. Um, Sister Lola, kindly unmute and ask your question. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Elisha. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, my question is <laughs> rather. Um, well, let me just ask, is there a relation between a narcissistic person and um, a schizo? Okay, so <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> I love it. I love it. A so narcissistic <laughs> person and a schizo. I love it. <laughs> I, kind of, I, kind of, I kind of see why you're saying that because when a narcissistic person, when they get, when they get into narcissistic rage, they look yes. psychotic. They look psychotic, okay? But they are not psychotic. Really? No, they're not. <laughs> no, no, they are not psychotic because anyone that is psychotic, they are not in tune with reality disorder. Okay, so what is narcissism? Narcissism involves what? A pattern of self-centeredness and a firm belief in your what? Superiority. That may look like a delusion. Exactly. Place. That's exactly why I thought it's going to look like it is going to look like. Is that a simile? It's going to look like it is not exactly it. Mm. It's going to look like it. So, which delusion happened to now be what? A form, a, a, some kind of formal symptom of psychosis. So, mm. your comparison is not off. Your comparison is actually brilliant. That means you've been really observing it. Or you've seen too, too, you've seen it too many times. You can't call it anything else than psychosis, but it's not. So narcissistic is in tune with reality. They are in tune with reality, right? Except they have all. Sometimes the, I wonder. They have grandiosity. They have grandiose thoughts of. They have. They have. They're full of themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. They are full of themselves. It's the layman word to use. However, somebody with psychosis, they are not in tune with reality. In fact. Some pregnant women, after they have a baby, they go into something called, called postpartum depression. Hmm. And then unfortunately in Africa, I, I know somebody that I happened to in Africa, they thought she was a witch. They hmm. didn't get it. We need to carry more education to Africa or take more education to Africa. And she suffered through it. And later she came out of it. But we, the psychosis also looks like a real psychosis. In fact, they treat them with antipsychotic. In fact, people that really drown their babies, it is real. Yeah. And it happens, you still have a year to, to go through that if it's real. So anybody can look psychotic. In fact, a temporary anger can look like a, like a psychosis, a rage. You yeah. know, imagine you're so raged, you're so angry, and three people are trying to hold you down. Of course, that's psychosis. Mm -hmm. They need to have a term for that. There's, there's nothing than psychosis. It shouldn't be psychosis though, because they know what they're doing at that moment, but they look like it. Mm. So that narcissistic rage, yeah, it looks like it, but it's not it. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Yeah, Sister Lola, um, what Dr. Elijah is talking about, there is that postpartum depression and there is postpartum psychosis. And you know, the depressed ones are so depressed, they don't even want to touch the baby. They have what is called that anhedonia. Dr. Elisha mentioned that earlier. Is the is when somebody does not have the get-go to do things that they normally would do, even things they normally enjoy, have fun doing, they don't have the get-go to do it. They have no energy. They, I mean, they listless, they they're not sleeping well. They just they can't they, they can't enjoy the baby. They don't even want to touch the baby sometimes. And then you have the other spectrum, the postpartum psychosis that God help us, you know, um, 
and either can drown their baby. But the narcissistic person, uh, they just, they arrogant, proud, they feel they, they are it, they're on top of the world, nobody's better than them, you know, but they are with it. They actually believe that. Yeah, that's my point, that I, I'm afraid that they might actually believe in what they're doing. They believe in in gaslighting people, in in oppressing others. And, and, like and I feel like they just don't know any better or something, or something is just not right up there. They, they above the world, right, Dr. Elisha? You want to comment on that? They, they feel on top of the world. And that is why uh, people are actually traumatized uh, going through life with a narcissistic personality disorder person uh, because uh, they've been exposed to this so much, they, are, they get traumatized by it. In fact, right now, they actually have narcissistic abused uh, patient recovery group. Like wow. it is that serious now. So it is serious. It is serious because when you get exposed to too much rage, there is a way it affects you as a person. There is a way it affects your mental state and it induces anxiety in you and the entire environment. So when people say they, are, when they say, when people say they look psychotic, I can see that. Are they looking or acting like delusional people? I can see, and these are all, concept that describes psychosis. So it is a complicated thing, but truly uh, people, it's like any other personality disorder now, right? Yes. Uh, for example, now, dependent personality disorder people, they don't think they are overly dependent. They don't, unless somebody tells them. Somebody that OCD, maybe sometimes they acknowledge it, but not always. Somebody that I have uh, antisocial, PD, they don't really see that unless somebody points it out. In fact, a mental health book actually pointed it out that Nigerians are antisocial. And I said, are you seriously kidding me? A real big book, Sadok and Sadok. And it's also, that question was also in my exam. And I'm like, is that real? So we don't know, right? Or somebody would describe us as aggressive. We don't know. Same thing, a narcissistic person do not know who they are. They don't see what people see, except for those that are willing to see it and willing to take it, and then they see it. But they will, they will never see it because they will continue to be defensive. That's just the definition of that pathology. That's just what it is. Is there medication for them? No. Nah. Usually, yeah, usually uh, psychotherapy. No. Nah. You know, the main thing, if they will accept it, and they use SSRIs for most personality disorders. Yeah, that's it. See, it's a personality disorder. It is not. Uh, it is not psychosis. And in order to get psychotherapy, you have to believe there's something wrong. Correct. That you want to fix. A narcissistic person <laughs> believe they know it all. True. Sure. So they're going to be more difficult to deal with. Yes. True. Yes. So you're not crazy if you're struggling with this, or if you know someone struggling with it. Or with such a person, they are not crazy. I actually will worry more about you, the person who is living with a narcissistic person. Correct. That person. They they end up with more mental health issues. Exactly. Than the narcissist themselves. Yeah. And and I hate to say this, they are the most charming men or the most charming women out there. Yeah. We also have we also have women narcissists women narcissists, not just men. I'm not trying to put the men on the spot here or trying to win a medal for the men, but I'm just saying, you know, women are narcissists too. But most men are in fact, a lot of more, we have a higher percentage of men that are narcissists, but more women are. I mean, more men are. More men are, yeah. More men are, but we have women too. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Excellent question. It's a difficult one. Um, to live with somebody who is a uh, narcissist. Well, Dr. Jagwe, you have a question. Kindly unmute, sir. And, and sorry, before you take that question, can I clearly add something too? Yes, that we also, have, we also have differential diagnosis for some condition that look like a narcissist, but they are not narcissists. So just take note of that. Some people, they are not, they are not, they are not narcissists 100%. 
they are narcissists maybe like 30%. The other type of personality is something else. So they look like narcissists. That's another different story. <laughs> that's even more scary. Hmm. Yes. Yes, that's, a, that's another topic. Thank you so much. And thanks for that question. Dr. Ajagwe, kindly ask your question. Hello, Dr. Elisha. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, you, you, when you started presenting, you were talking about uh, the Nigerian uh, presentation of uh, psychosis. Uh, the people that are, that are being referred to as weary uh, on the streets. Now, can you say something about the, uh, the lunar cycle as it affects them? Because sometimes uh, part of the myth or part of the understanding is that there are certain times of the month that these people actually have worse symptomatology than other part, uh, other times of the month. Can you explain that? Sorry, I broke. You broke for a moment. I didn't hear some parts. I just heard the weary. That was the last thing I heard before your question. Well, I'm talking about lunar cycle. Uh, does anything uh, from your understanding is there any relevance of lunar cycle on the uh, severity of presentation? of uh, psychosis. Uh, yes, sir, that's so brilliant. And I can tell you right now that some people actually get psychotic in the springs. There was a, there's a research on that. Um, the spring, spring specifically. So there is something that has to do with weather, with how people feel. I know, of course, the one for depression is more common, but for psychosis, yeah. I, I'm, I'm aware of the spring springtime, that during the spring, spring, during the spring months, some people just naturally get psychotic. Yeah, the, what I'm actually alluding to is that when you get a full moon, so, you know, the lunar cycle, you see the time that uh, the moon doesn't show, then you have a crescent moon, then you have full moon. And there have been, uh, I, at least I understood that from Nigeria that many people's uh, symptoms uh, became exacerbated during the full moon. So, and I think some people have already also alluded to that fact here in the U.S. that those who work in the psychiatric uh, department, uh, those in the residential type, always complain that many of the patients have this uh, flare of their symptoms at certain times of the month. And there's been some association with uh, the lunar cycle. Okay, thanks so much for clarifying that. And, and it's true about that. So what is true about that again is though, you know, we have types of schizophrenia, right? So they all respond to this differently. For example, somebody with schizophrenia, uh, when there is a new moon, they're actually very, very stable. It is true, to, it's true that when they have a full moon, when there is a full moon, like during the first quarter of the year, when they have when there's a full moon, uh, they tend to get worse. It is very true. There's a research that backs this up. But on the other on the other hand, people with paranoid schizophrenia, they are worse when it comes to uh, when, when there is full moon. They deteriorate more. So there is a lot that the way the weather plays a part. The the moon, the spring, the season of the year does play a part. So you're right. Thank you. Specifically, you're welcome. Specifically, it is in fact the full moon that right. makes the worst. Um, yeah. The new moon, the start in, they are stable in the new moon, like when the moon first you know shows up, they are stable at that time. So, but yeah, it does affect them. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome, sir. Thank you so much. So um you mentioned before that you were thinking of starting mental health, a mental health facility in Nigeria, but a pastor discouraged you. We do have ARU, uh, which is a huge psychiatric center in Abekuta. And I have referred people there before and they get adequate care. 
So I just want to encourage you not to listen to that pastor, that, you know, Nigeria is not that backward that we, um, right. <laughs> that, you know, mental, we, and a lot of education is going on. We need to do a lot more. Uh, we've done quite a bit of mental health education on this platform also, and we need to continue to do that in order to create awareness. Mental With mental health, there is a huge stigma in African culture um, generally where people hear mental health and they just think of the negative, would not get care and don't want to be associated with anything to do with uh, mental health issues. But, so we need to continue the dialogue, but you know, you would benefit as society a lot, you know, if you have you still thinking of starting a facility um, in Nigeria, I think you should go for it. I don't think we have a very good one in Lagos. So sorry, yeah, I was I think it's on my end. Oh, okay. So I just wanted to I just wanted to encourage you um, on that. Um, Dr. Fawali said, thanks for the comprehensive presentation. Is there a way to prevent or alleviate these disorders? Um, that's an excellent question because prevention is always better than care. And it's one of the things that we advocate on this platform also, how to prevent different disease entities, you know, before they actually start because in generally medicine, we do better with prevention. So is there a way to prevent any of, or to prevent these disorders? So, okay. So some natural causes we cannot pretend, like genetics too, we cannot uh, prevent, right? So I guess maintaining healthy life, life uh, healthy lifestyle, keeping yourself sane, not small, small things get to you, staying away from drugs, uh, those are the primary prevention, but some other factors, there are some other causes that we just don't know, that we just don't know. So I can tell you right now, once it hit, unfortunately, there is no cure. We're talking medically speaking, I'm not really going spiritual. I know some people believe it's going to go away spiritually, but I'm talking pathophysiologically. I'm sorry, it ain't going nowhere. Uh, when schizophrenia comes, it comes to stay. Uh, so definitely to prevent it, though, um, I would say, you know, sometimes our own, the way, we, the rate at which we let things get to us sometimes, too, can really lead to psychosis. People go crazy from relationship issues. We have to be careful not to let things get to us to that bad. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, that's it. If, 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 we, if, we, if we lose it, that, that's it. We can never, we can never take it back. I cannot really pinpoint specifically how to prevent it because we don't even know the cause yet. But the only causes that we know right now, they are hypotheses. They think it is due to excess dopamine in the mesolimbic and decreased dopamine in the mesocortical. They also think it's genetic causes. And then they also think it's due to intrauterine insults. So you see how that would be so hard to really prevent. You know, it is not like hypertension, like, okay, don't eat sweets, don't eat sugar, don't eat salt. All those small, small things we know we can stay away. So apart from all those original causes, if we have to look deeply into our own life, we can say we can possibly prevent it uh, by maintaining our own sanity, our own self. Doing a little bit, see a little bit of CBT on ourselves, not letting things get to us, avoiding stress. Some people also hypothesize that stress can also be a trigger. Uh, so we have to avoid things like that. So that's pretty much all I have to add. If I have anything extra, I would definitely send to Dr. O because that's definitely good to know. Uh, but honestly, most of us don't have the answers. Yeah. Schizophrenia is tough. It's tough, yeah. Um, schizophrenics um, basically cannot function in, in society. You know, so when it comes to prevention, um, hi. Sister Rosemary, you raised your hand. Um, I say on good evening, everyone. Thank you Thank so much. That was a great presentation. Yeah. I once had a client uh, that had schizophrenia and um, he was on so many medications 
and uh, I, if you if you get to the root of the of the issue, there's there's always a, a, a big ch a big chance that we can recover, you know, and uh, this particular gentleman had so many things that happened to him when he was young, and uh, I I. I had to put him through uh, forgiveness therapy, which he did, and he came out of it. Okay, so um, I agree with my sister that you know they, they don't have a cure for it, but this spiritually you can you know <laughs> work on it and really get a good result. Hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Did he, did he have schizophrenia or yes, he did? He did, did. He have depression? He did. It was schizophrenia. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it was schizophrenic. So okay. um prevention. Oh, okay. Dr. Fawale, great. I'm happy you raised your hand. Go ahead. Thank you, Sister Rosemary. You're welcome. Dr. Fawale, please, kindly on. Oh. There you go. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. I asked that question because thinking about it in our community, I think one of the one of the things we had to learn as a Nigerian community is to seek help. To seek help when we are challenged, especially emotionally, because we're talking about stress can lead, can contribute to all these disorders that we're talking about. I think seeking help might help us. When we get to the point where we are able to call on somebody, somebody, a trusted person to help us, along with this education, and thank God for Medical Mondays, that is bringing this different a form of education onto this community, I think is very essential because a lot of people are suffering in silence um, in different sectors. And that's one thing I wanna add to it. And some of us here, maybe, you know, those that got grace, um, we can engage in mentorship of others that may be in our circle of influence. And um, God help us. Amen. God help us. I don't want to take too much time. I think our, present, our presenter did a wonderful job of giving us all, you know, a lot of things that we need to really ponder on. But challenge when things are not going right, when maybe this disorder might appear one way or the other, seeking help will help us. I pray. Amen. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jagbe, you have your hand raised, sir. Go yes. <clears throat> um, again, I want to go back to Nigeria's situation. Um, there are so many uh, native uh, <laughs> psychiatrists, I could call them, <laughs> uh, people who seem to be intervening, particularly when some, you know, some people are accosted and they said they want to force them to be helped. I, I remember, uh, you know, visiting a particular church, uh, you know, when the compound they have places where they said they were taking care of, uh, you know, uh, crazy people. And the, what I saw was so horrendous. Mm -hmm. I mean, they actually using chain to Correct. chain down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was so broken. I mean, I was so heartbroken just watching these people being chained to the ground. And they, many of them were just cathetic. Many of them were malnourished. They were punishing them for, for behavior they have no control over. So, you know, I know there are some that are religious based. And I know there are some traditional uh healers who also have their own and they constantly you know just abuse these people because of ignorance 
I think the kind of education that you have uh, should be disseminated uh, in that part of the world where the you know many of these people might have been killed uh, in, in inadvertently because of the way they were being treated, and uh, you know not understanding that this has uh, you know um, an organic uh, you know problem that needs to be addressed uh, mm -hmm. medically, uh, you know, is really not helpful. So I'm kind of advocating uh, if there's a way uh, your means of reaching out, your outreach to the community can reach out to those people. Uh, I know there are so many of those in, in the Western part of Nigeria. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Elisha, yes, ma'am, suggested some. No, I wanted to let the let our family knows that you suggested some natural ways of prevention. So, and they include fish oil and omega three fatty acids that they've been shown to help. Also, um, social skills training good coping mechanisms or coping skills. Um, and the triggers include combination of physical, genetic, um, psychological, and environment factors. So, you know, when it is known that insults that could occur during pregnancy can be a cause of things like schizophrenia, that is tough. One cannot change that. Right. Right. Genetics, one cannot change. Right. And that's why I'm still scrambling to see how does one prevent this? One thing that I want to mention, Auntie Tawa, I saw your address. I just want to quickly mention this, is that what I see in our culture um, that I pray that we can change individually, and I'm guilty also, is that we tend to keep things to ourselves a lot. We don't want others to know um, challenges or things that we're going through. And that can be problematic. Whereas sharing with trusted people um, could help most of the time would help to alleviate issues that could potentially lead to, you know, mental health issues. So that's a cultural thing that I pray that we can overcome to be more open and uh, to trust one another, at least have some, maybe one or two people in our circle that we can share things with in depth and um, people who can, who we trust that will not go out and spread um, whatever, um, whatever they're told. So I think that may help. And that would also, you know, fall in line with uh, the coping mechanism or coping skills. Um, in dealing with things. Auntie Tawa, you can unmute, ma. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Elisha, uh, my question right now is, um, there are some people that are schizophrenic and they are working with a um, regular job with the society. Uh, but if I might quote you correctly, you said, um, even with medication, they cannot function. Can what, what happens, those people are functioning and they are, they are really bad. Okay, so if they, uh, thanks so much for that question. So if they are, if, if, if you say schizophrenia though, uh, at what stage are they still mild? If they are mild, truly they can even potentially keep a marriage to some extent. But don't forget, it's a progressive disorder, unfortunately. But when we're talking about the full-blown ones that we say is in the facility, that they're in the facility already, there is no functioning. But if it is still mild, those ones that you're talking about, I can call it a prodromal phase or something. They are not full-blown yet. They can still marry, they can still have a job, but they don't keep a job, according to research. Mm -hmm. That's true. They don't keep a marriage. They don't keep it. It doesn't, there is stress. Everything we do in life comes with stress. 
-hmm. So the level of stress that it comes with, they cannot manage it for too long. It will show. So it is true that they may have a job, but they don't keep it. But that's usually at the early stage too. Otherwise they won't, they won't qualify. Thank you. And mm -hmm. the um, postpartum depression, um, which they call the third day blues, um, how do you get rid of that? <laughs> you, uh, if it gets so bad, for the most part, they get treated like a normal depression. As long as somebody picks it up, and sometimes they just get past that phase. A lot of women actually have that after birth. They don't even realize it. A lot of women have it. They don't know. Maybe when they now pass and, you know, maybe they read, they, they went out and read it somewhere and they now connect with those like symptoms. They will now be like, oh, actually, I think I had this. Mm -hmm. So most women, it's not uncommon. What is not common is most uh, postpartum psychosis. But postpartum depression, you can't really prevent it. Unfortunately, some get it, some don't. When you get it, hopefully you are around your loved ones that recognize it and they will show some understanding so you don't struggle through it. That is what is important. It can also be treated. You know, treated. with treatment, you know, they, they do well, they fare well, yeah. just like somebody with depression. The problem right. with the treatment of depression that we have now is that with all the medications we have, it takes a good six weeks to get... Yeah. Um, yeah. To start get to start for the medication to start kicking in. And the first thing people usually get back is the energy. But then, you know, it takes a good six weeks, six to eight weeks to get the full effect of the medication. And so uh, taking the medication every day is very important. You know, compliance is important. So like Dr. Elisha said, it's great always to have some good people around someone who can help one navigate these things. And for schizophrenia, schizophrenics actually get treated. And, you know, Dr. Elisha, you mentioned that earlier. We have anti um, doping, um, antipsychotic, antipsychotics. Anti we also have anti dopinergic um, medications that are used to treat schizophrenics and can provide some stability. The problem also is side effects. These Correct. medications have side effects of, you know, some um, abnormal movements, you know, even, you know, sometimes they become um, catatonic. You know, how do you describe that? Yeah, it's too poor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so there are different side effects that these medications trigger. Um, more work still needs to be done in this area to see what can be done. But, you know, sometimes they have, you know, some stability, not, maybe not be able to work, but, you know, uh, able to do things. I actually have a patient who is schizophrenic, who is working, who is doing fantastic now. The patient was horrible, bad when we first met. But by the grace of God, has been doing well, has a girlfriend now. And um, you can still tell there's a problem. Something is off. But, you know, at least the patient is functional, actually very empathetic, always kind to me. And um, that wasn't the case before. And uh, I actually took, took the patient on to treat the patient because um, the patient has seen several psych psychiatrists and uh, not gotten good results. And, you know, just decided to uh, give it a shot and was able to stabilize him, at least, you know, have him have some quality of life. So it's not all there or bad, but when they are full blown, like Dr. Elisha said, they've been in the street and all that, that is tough. Mm -hmm, that is, yeah. That is tough. That is actually what the book presents. Unfortunately, <laughs> they present a full blown madness and, you know, schizophrenic, but, but we do, yeah, I'm sure we have some mild ones. So, yeah. but, you made a really good point, and I really appreciate that. And I, I really desire that the stereotype will stop, that women or men that go out to speak out their minds on whatever bothers them to take off the weight a little bit. I wish the stereotype would stop that they talk too much. They are gossiping about somebody. They, I hope they will stop seeing it as a gossip and start seeing it as a way for that person to cope and be able to get up and do things and be able to see where the problem is. Does it make sense? 
Uh, yeah. So we actually have something we call psychotherapy. Psychotherapy means talk therapy, at least here in the Western world. Unfortunately, in Africa, when you talk to your neighbor about what's going on with you, they start seeing you, they give you names, Alaroka, Elejo Wewe, want to call, oh man, I want to start speaking Yoruba now. They will start <laughs> thinking, I totally forgot myself. They will give you the song, they will come up with a song, <laughs> blast the woman, that next time even you don't want to open your mouth to talk. Yeah. And it should never, never be that way. Personally, I'm a big believer of talk, of communicate. Even if I'm in, if I'm, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm your friend and I'm doing something that is not right to you, and you are not able to talk to me about it and you talk to somebody else about it to help you weigh the situation so that you can better handle it, I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see it as you backbiting or bad mouthing. It's just the person is looking for a way forward. That is it. We should start seeing it like that in Africa. Anyone that talks about you is looking for a way forward. That's it. And you should be glad that somebody is talking about you because you're alive. That is the only person somebody can talk about. It is not a sin to talk and relate to people about things that bother us. It is not a sin. It is a therapy. Hmm. That's true. It uh, is a therapy. Can I ask a question or a comment? Yes, Thank yes, you so yes, much. Dr. For Buka. This. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> laughing. Thank you so much for this. But the thing you didn't mention is when people are getting married, I remember in medical school, one particular the groom's par parents said, oh, no, they couldn't marry this girl. She was the top of her class because her family had schizophrenia. Oh, yeah, I know that is something. Oh, <laughs> I just wanted to make that comment. No, wait a minute. She was the top of her class. She was it's the head. She was, she was number one in her class. But the groom's parents did not want them to get married because of that family history. They eventually got married very quietly years ago, but nothing big because of that family history of schizophrenia. And the other thing too, I've known of somebody whose mom died when she was about 12, had passed to go to like the top school, Queen's College, and just got depressed and ended up with schizophrenia, but functional most of her life. Mm -hmm. mm. She got married, had kids, but had to take medication. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Those are just, but it was very wow. interesting tonight. Even the change of topic, I, I'm i very bad at psychiatry. So I learned a lot tonight. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank so, you. Dr. Buka, thank you so much for bringing, you know, for, you know, that comment, because I know for sure that even when I was going to get married, I remembered my parents sending somebody from Lagos to my um, in-laws home and area in Elisha to go investigate them. And I remembered them saying specifically they need to investigate if there are mental health issues <laughs> in wow. place. I just remembered as you said that, and I've heard since then that, you know, um, in our culture, especially the Yorubas, they actually investigate uh, families before they allow their children marry into, into wherever they want to marry into. And they will stop the marriage if, or, or the wedding, they will stop them getting getting married if there are mental health issues or um, some diseases like things like leprosy, which is you know infectious, you know out of ignorance that is infectious um, and stuff like that. They would they would not allow the the relationship to go on. Thank you for for saying that. We have a lot of educating to do. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Dr. Jagbe, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, for anybody who has been diagnosed with, uh, you know, any of these psychotic uh, diseases or disorders, um, for them to be functional, they have to be compliant with medication. All right, absolutely. If they, if they get the right diagnosis, and they get the right prescription, and they are not using the medication, they're not gonna be. Uh, so I think 
uh, from Dr. O's uh, example, for that individual to be functional and be able to uh, communicate and be in a relationship, I, I can say it must be because the person is really compliant and taking uh, all his medication and going for checkup and doing everything that he needs to do to be able to stay afloat. So I think compliance is something that has to be pushed because a whole lot of times if all the efforts are made, the diagnosis are correct, the medications are given, and if the patient doesn't have the will or the consistency of taking the medication, they would be like they have not been diagnosed. Um, you're right on the money. And because this particular patient I'm talking about never misses their refills. I remember, you know, before the medication is out, before refill is needed, the person would, you know, the patient would uh, make an appointment to make sure that the medications are refilled and always, always compliant. You're right. And the, the, the patient is still also in counseling. I think as you mentioned that, that is important. And I, I think the counselor is excellent and is a big part of that um, compliance. It's very important. With, with mental health medications, they have to be taken and they have to be taken religiously. If they are not, they wash out of the system. They just will not do what we want them to do with any mental health, be it depression, anxiety, uh, schizophrenia, what have you, anything bipolar disorder, they have to be um, compliant. You're right. And in addition to that, somebody released something about, you know, some things that we, should, we need to be doing as a, as a checklist before waiting. Um, honestly, it's all in there. Mental health assessment, possible genetic disorder, STD, hepatitis, you know, those, those normal things. Genotype test, blood, People have a long list now. I don't think anybody really follows it though. But I think honestly, uh, even though it looks funny on WhatsApp status and stuff, I think it's still, I think there are important things that we tend to ignore. But another thing to the dynamics of all this thing is we are, we get diagnosed in, you know, the Western world, right? There are, there are resources and we believe in mental health for the most part. But in Africa, if you diagnose somebody with common depression or bipolar, the, the, oh my gosh, like you'll be glad to make it alive, make it out alive from your office because they would think you call them crazy. So even if they don't even believe in it or they don't even understand it, do you think they will probably comply? That would be, I don't know, that would be a little bit. So we still have a lot, a lot of ways to go in Africa. Uh, and, I, and I really look forward to us doing more work there with education um, of our people. Every people are really backwards when it comes to mental health. Mental health does not mean you're biting trees or you are eating things from the floor. That's the mentality in Africa. Yeah. Yeah, that's the mentality. So we have a long way to go. That is true. But Dr. Elisha, even here, um, I've diagnosed patients. I say, ah, it's not my lot in Jesus' name. Hey, Something like, no. you know what I'm saying? Then well, you are looking crazy. Like, well, why did you open your mouth to speak, right? Meanwhile, you're doing your job. You, are, you can't, you can't sugarcoat it, right? No, <laughs> no, you can't. So you have to say the same way it is written. So. You just have to then spend the time to educate. And um, in this time when the, the time is 15 minutes, um, you know, I've, I was told that all over people write the waiting time in my waiting area is long because I spend the time the patient needs with the patient. When I get there, my when I see that, my heart sinks because I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, I have to stop and educate this person. And it takes time. It does. It does. Most of the time. It does what they need it though, right? Yes. You're doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, most of the time they get it. They get it and before they leave, they promise they'll take the medication and they abide with it. And you know, the beauty of this is when they start seeing after two weeks, the person who has been, you know, tired, fatigued, could not stay focused and all of that, they start seeing that they're energetic, they, they, they can do things. Um, they tell me because I see them two weeks after I start medication all the time. 
Two weeks is my mark. And they'll be like, you know what? I have more energy to do this. I, I encourage them to continue. By six weeks, they're a different person. And they'll be like, whoa, before I would handle this like this, or a, a situation like this, now I'm handling it like this. And they see the difference. That helps them to continue their medication. But it takes work. It takes commitment on the part of the clinician um, to get our people where they need to be. So we have work to do. I mean, the Lord continues to give us strength in education and, you know, especially, and in just helping, helping our people understand the need that mental health needs to be addressed and properly treated. Otherwise, people will Amen. Attain, the, otherwise people will not attain their highest potential. They won't. Ah. It's very important. So, any other questions? Hi, Dr. No. Elisha, you've been amazing. Thank you so much. With the change of topic, with you having no electricity, and you know what? I know there are some people from Nigeria in Nigeria right now on this platform. And I think they'll be laughing that, aha, no electricity. dealing with Nepal. <laughs> this is the first time this year, just in case you guys are listening, first time this year. <laughs> first time this year, but it is still light out. So technology is technology. But um, we thank you so much for um, still showing up and um, delivering over and beyond. Uh, we're going to look forward to that cultural um, presentation. We'll have a chat to see if, you know, we can do it next week because that is so important or if we need to move it. I'll have a chat with you, um, you know, I'm behind closed doors. Absolutely. So um, for now, can you give us your parting words before we go into the Medical Mondays moment? All right. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for all the insights you've learned from me. And I've learned a whole lot from everybody too, but this is no man's, this is not one person's job. Uh, the world is so large. So whatever impact we can make, uh, just like Dr. O said, to continue to impact people so they can achieve their potentials. Uh, this will come through education and enlightening, especially uh, usually the third world countries. They don't have a clue uh, what mental health is about. So I look forward to, you know, being a part of this movement and I hope you do too. And uh, if you have for any reason stigmatized people with schizophrenia in the past, I really hope this uh, session change your view totally today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We appreciate you and please don't leave yet. So Medical Monday's moment. You know, um, I have come to love a Medical Mondays family. And I note every week, our family members who are always here. Um, I have news. One of our very own sisters, Naomi, who was a participant of Medical Mondays, um, she was always a silent listener always on the forum, even when she was very ill, she would yeah. still come on. Um, she departed. Oh. No way. Mm -mm. Last Saturday, Dr. Jagbe, I was in Nigeria. I had no clue. I didn't know. Wow. Naomi passed last Saturday. No way. Um, I felt I needed to share that. If we can just give her um, a moment of silence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. But you know what? Mm. Naomi lived. She mm. has lived. But we are still here. Mm. This is a lesson. Mm. 
and we need to love each other. Where forgiveness is needed. Um, and just enjoy one another because life is short. And in all of this, I want to say that we will celebrate Naomi's life. Um, and we will continue to celebrate one another uh, we that are still here. And so that leads me to, to shift gears to celebrate one of our very own family member um, who is always here on Medical Mondays, has been a presenter here on Medical Mondays, presenter for many weeks actually uh, with the, with the, with the, on, on a group, and um, who was awarded this award mm -hmm. this last weekend. Um, if anybody knows about the Peace Award, the Peace Award is uh, the award that has been given to the likes of, uh, I think Desmond Tutu, right? Um, and many like that. I'm going to, you know, just introduce or reintroduce to us our very own sister, Dr. Veronica Ofwebune, who is the chairperson of the Nigerian American Public Affairs Committee in California. My very own amazing Dr. V, who is a mover and shaker at NAPAC, uh, Nigerian American Public Affairs Committee, that's NAPAC in California, who impacts not just California, but all over the nation. Um, so, <laughs> She's also a regional director for Region 6. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank and you also, so much. And, al and also a vice chair for the board of directors for Napa USA. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> she is um, she's somebody you call anytime. Any time of the day, Dr. V is there and you need anything done. You know, when you commit something to Dr. V, consider it done. You don't even need to look back. It is done. She would do it. Um, she's Miss reliable, dependable, um, honest, loving, always, always smiling. Look, the list goes on. And this award is so very well deserving that Dr. V, um, I'm gonna bring you on. The floor is yours to share with us this prestigious and uh, well-deserving award. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. O. I, when I was taking, uh, getting the award, I actually was thinking of you and thinking of uh, so many amazing, I, I actually believe that the description you gave is that of you right now. <laughs> and I wanna thank you for this moment of, of uh, um, I guess, sharing about what we NAPACs do. So I think that I, I, re I represent what all NAPAC people do. They don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> like you couldn't sleep even at home. You were calling us during your night. Um, but I, again, I think it's the passion that all of us have. And for me, I think that uh, Dr. O's uh, O Mondays represent all of the people on this platform who are um, excellent individuals, professionals who are giving up their own time. Just look at our sister who just... Uh, was so eloquent. She could be, you could wake her up from sleep and she'll do this presentation. Yeah. I believe yeah. that that's what the pedigree of all of the people are. Dr. Ajagwe and uh, Papa and all of you. I, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about you. So I feel like, and I want to thank the leadership of uh, NAPAC. What they have created is not about one individual. It's about community. These are amazing, brilliant initiative. I am so humbled to be part of NAPAC. NAPAC is a movement. It's not even about Nigeria. It's a global movement. It's emancipation and transformation of lives and communities. It's changing lives every day. And I know that it's a journey. One day we will see that impact happen in Nigeria. And everybody knows that when Nigeria changes, then Africa changes. And the lot of 
the black and brown people across the world would change. The, uh, the experiences of all those that are experiencing injustice, inequity, uh, social justice will take the place and we will be free. Um, so this is no easy feat, no small feat. Uh, Ms. Okusanya, thank you. Mrs. Uh, Dr. Oh, thank you. Mrs. Okunubi, thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Soji Adelaja, thank you. Mr. Uh, Dr. Okpongwa, thank you. Dr. Aluya, thank you. Uh, Mr. Dr. Edafe, I want to remember all those who funded the NAPAC table. Uh, Mr. Taye Dohati, he is an amazing soul. He drove all the way from Palm Spring to Sacramento to represent NAPAC. Miss Nene of NAPAC, a new NAPAC uh, member. So many people, please forgive me if I didn't say your name. I just really appreciate everyone being there. Uh, I, I feel humbled that California State University would recognize the work that of NAPAC that we're doing here. So thank you, California State University, Professor Wazir, doing an amazing job on social justice and uh, conflict resolution. And so thank you. The award was called the Peace Builder. And I, again, I feel like that's not just me, it's every one of you here on the platform, Dr. O, saving a life on the airplane. What else would you do? <laughs> oh, not do, you're amazing. Thank you for the moment. And again, I don't wanna take more than that. I love what I do, passionate about it, and I'm happy to be among all of you all. Thank you. Thank Congrats. you for yes. all you do. Not thank you, sir. Thank you. So, if, uh, Ms. Ms. Mr. Okusoya, please, can you give us a shout out? That is our the father of NAPAC. Please, amen. Give us a amen. shout out. Shout out in what way? Show, just show your face. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> show my face. Yes, just like what, this. What Thank about you. what about go Lakers? <laughs> I'll get in trouble with that one, so I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> anyway, it is well. Thank you so much. Thank you. you know, Thank God you. bless you all. Mr. Yes. Kusoya is uh, one of the founders, the father of NAPAC, and uh, Mr. Taye Doherty Maonegbon. So I'll show your face. That was that's our ex uh, president uh, for the NAPAC Foundation. Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So show your face, sir. Shout out to us. We want a shout out. <laughs> Mr. Doherty, it was on a minute ago. He's still there. He's still He's there. Yeah, maybe. I think that it. was that him. Yeah. Yeah. So I, saw, shout out. I thought I saw him. Yeah. I saw him. Please unmute. Where on earth is he? He's What's there. That? He's on mute. Uh, can you unmute, sir, Mr. Doherty? He might have stepped away from his Probably. Oh. Yeah. I can, I can try to get, yeah. him on. get him on. I just want to appreciate, you know, um, Dr. V, I just want to appreciate you. And, you know, we have some other, uh, Sister Wumi. Oh, yeah. Our Sister Wumi is the Hello, most reliable, everybody. generous secretary in the whole entire world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Talented. Thank you. Congratulations again, Dr. V. As you know, we couldn't attend because you know what happened with the um yes. The um yes. celebration of life on Saturday. So yes. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Thank you for representing. I've been members. working with the family on the yeah. funeral process. Yeah. And the embassy. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of the um California members were at that event. So that was mm -hmm. why we but yeah. well deserved, my sister.